with ABC News Live. A deadly mass shooting inside a medical building. I have two small children, and their schools were on lockdown responding to this tragedy. A key area of Atlanta shut down for hours. Investigators reveal that all of the victims are women. What we know at this hour. Plus, I've done miracles to keep us off of the streets, you know. I believe me and my kids' lives would be different if San Diego's wait list was like, you know, a couple months or a year. The fight to find affordable housing. ABC News Live investigates the hurdles as families struggle with names on wait lists for more than a decade, hoping for approval. And how important is it to be behind screen as well, sitting in that chair? It's everything. For the longest time, our stories were told by other people who didn't really understand our culture, did not walk in our shoes. Juju Chang has our culture conversation, examining the power of AAPI representation behind the screen. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more, including Serbia's first ever school shooting. A 13-year-old is accused of killing eight children and a security guard. The immediate response from the country's president. Plus, claims from Russia that this video shows an attempted drone strike. The accusations from the Kremlin tonight against Ukraine. And it's a motto to live by. I sit down with a Peloton instructor who is passing the message to live, learn, and love well. Our correspondents are fanned out around the world covering those stories and more for us tonight. But we begin with a search for a gunman who opened fire at a doctor's office in the heart of Atlanta, killing at least one person and injuring four others, all of them women. The suspect escaped as police were arriving the scene tonight. Police say he is armed and dangerous. The first call about the active shooter came in just after 12 p.m. Police locked the area down, including nearby schools, ordering people to shelter in place before they realized the suspect was gone. Atlanta police quickly released these surveillance images of the suspect and have asked for the public's help in finding him. The city of Atlanta is just the latest community to deal with a mass shooting in 2023. According to the Gun Violence Archive, there have been 190 so far this year in this country. At this hour, we are told the hunt for the gunman is widening. Our senior national correspondent, Steve Osinsami, leads us off tonight from Atlanta. The first bullets tore through the busy lunch hour in Midtown Atlanta. They're now advising the active shooter, a person shot. It was right outside the reception desk of a doctor's office and into the waiting room. They're advising a female shot. She's seriously bleeding, shot in the side in the back. People had to choose between running for their lives and helping the wounded. All of them women. One who was 39 years old died. Four others were rushed to the hospital. Dr. Timothy Simon was in surgery in an office on the floor above. And then I heard some policemen outside saying, you know, come out with your hands up or hold your hands up. To, and I was like, hmm, that doesn't sound good. And so then, then at that point, they, they made sure that, that I was not a, a, a shooter. And then they brought me out and then they um, escorted us all down the stairs. Within minutes, Atlanta police were sharing these surveillance images from an elevator of 24-year-old Dion Patterson. He served in the Coast Guard and left the service in January of this year. On the streets, chaos, then a police lockdown and a desperate search for the accused killer. Police say Patterson tried to carjack a driver in the parking lot and say he then successfully carjacked a driver a block away and drove away with the car. North of Atlanta in the suburbs, police were chasing down leads. We have a multi-jurisdictional effort underway to bring this individual to justice and ensure that we remove him from the street. Everyone consider him still armed and presenting a danger to whatever community he may find himself in at this time. By one count, it's the 190th mass shooting in America this year. In Washington, a Georgia senator took his sorrow to the Senate floor. I have two small children, and their schools were on lockdown responding to this tragedy. As a pastor, I'm, I'm praying for those who are affected by this tragedy, but I hasten to say that thoughts and prayers are not enough. Thoughts and prayers is something that we continue to hear. Steve Osinsami joins us now from Atlanta. Steve, what's the latest that you can tell us about this growing manhunt? 
Well, authorities are searching north of the city where they tell us that this suspect was seen just a few minutes after the shooting here. They're, they're searching in the suburbs north of Atlanta, and that also is the same place where at least one school was put on lockdown today. Now, Lindsay, I'm standing directly outside the building where this happened, and, you know, we've seen so many of these shootings, and they're touching so many Americans that even I have a connection to this one. This was my doctor's office. I spent plenty of time in the waiting room in this building behind me waiting for my doctor here. And I can tell you that many of the medical professionals who were impacted by this today are just some of the greatest ever. Lindsay. Hitting so close to home for so many. Steve Osinsami, our thanks to you. We move overseas to a shocking explosion over the Kremlin. The video shows what appears to be a drone flying toward the dome of the building and exploding over the Russian Senate building. Video circulating online appears to show the dome on fire. Tonight, Ukraine is strongly denying claims from Russia that they are responsible. So who launched the attack and why? Marcus Moore reports in tonight from Ukraine. Tonight, those stunning images showing apparent drones exploding over the Kremlin. Video posted by state media of the moment the first drone smashed into the Senate Palace Dome around 2.27 in the morning. 16 minutes later, a second drone exploding as it approached the Russian flag. Smoke billowing from the scene. Russia tonight accusing Ukraine of an assassination attempt on Vladimir Putin, who was not there, calling it, quote, a planned terrorist attack and saying it intercepted both drones using radar warfare systems, the Kremlin providing no evidence to back up its claims, but also issuing an ominous warning, saying Russia has the right to retaliate where and when it sees fit. President Zelensky today in Finland fiercely denying Ukraine's involvement. We don't attack Putin or Moscow. We fight on, on our territory. We are defending our villages and cities. We don't have you know, enough weapon for this. Secretary Blinken today questioning Russia's claims. I would take anything coming out of the Kremlin with a very large shaker of salt. Among the possible scenarios, did Ukraine order the attack? Was it conducted by a pro-Ukrainian group inside Russia, or was it the Russians who put the drones up themselves to make it look like Ukraine attacked them? This coming after multiple attacks inside Russia, including drone strikes on oil depots and two train derailments on back-to-back -back days. So let's get right to Marcus Moore, who's in Ukraine for us. And Marcus, as you know, there was a closed door briefing on Capitol Hill today about these alleged drone strikes. What more are you hearing from U.S. officials? Well, Lindsay, Senator Mark Warner with the uh, Senate Intelligence Committee said that at this point there is no indication that Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian forces were behind what happened uh, that we are aware of, he said. And late today, the U.S. Embassy in Kyiv warning Americans in the region to be on high alert for Russian retaliation. And, Lindsay, you may be able to hear the air raid sirens going off right now where we are this evening. And, and so I imagine you, you need to seek shelter right away. Is that basically what that signals? Okay, Marcus Moore will let you go. Yes, Thanks so much. Yes, that's absolutely what we should do. Okay, thank, thank you. you, Lindsay. Joining us now with more is ABC News contributor and retired Colonel Steve Ganyard. Steve, always appreciate you joining us on the show. And let's go rapid fire here as we don't have tons of time. Are you surprised that whoever carried out this attack was able to get a drone directly over the Kremlin? Uh, sure am, uh, that they could get somebody that close. Remember, Lindsay, that with drones, you have to be within about a mile or two to control them. So this tells Putin that there's a saboteur or more than a saboteur in his midst. So they had to have gotten within a mile or two of the target. And we see that they very deliberately, at least in the, uh, the attack on the Senate Palace building, very deliberately tried to go after the flagpole, missed by a little bit, but ended up creating a small fire in the roof. So very little damage, but the significance, the, 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 uh, the visual significance, uh, much more humiliating to Putin than it was the damage itself. And, and Ukraine says that they're not responsible, but how will this type of attack impact the war on the ground in Ukraine? Uh, hard to say at this point. I mean, Zelensky has to say, I didn't try to assassinate him. And it's clear they didn't try an assassination here. They were trying to make the point just prior to kicking off their offensive uh, this spring that they wanted they could bring the war to Moscow. And so he had to say, I didn't try to kill Putin. Don't try to kill me in return. He also doesn't want the U.S. coming back saying, hey, stop throwing gas on the fire. Even though Russia has been operating inside Ukraine since the beginning of the war, the U.S. has been trying to hold back the Ukrainians from escalating uh, 
the war by going into Russia itself. And, and finally, U.S. officials today said to be careful about taking anything from Russia at face value. Of course, earlier in the war, intelligence officials had brought up that Russia was planning some false flag operations in order to try and blame Ukraine for attacks that they actually carried out themselves. Is there any chance at all in your mind that this could be a false flag operation? Yeah, sure, there's, there's a chance because Putin uses false flags all the time. He has throughout his, his whole, uh, for, for decades he's done this. But you have to think about in a false flag, what is it that we think that he's trying to achieve? And the fact that Ukraine was able to get inside of Moscow after Putin for months had been bragging how he increased the air defenses around Moscow, get in with drones. They obviously were not taken down. They attacked, hit, did some damage, but the psychological damage was the real uh, problem here. So I think uh, Putin probably risked more to his reputation by creating a false flag now, it really didn't do him any good if it was, in fact, a false flag. Colonel Steve Ganyard, always appreciate your time and insight. Thanks so much. Thanks, Lindsay. Next to a school shooting in Serbia, where a 13-year-old student opened fire with his father's pistol, killing eight classmates and a security guard, injuring seven others. He then called police and surrendered without incident. Police say he carefully planned the attack and had a list of children that he planned to kill. Serbia's president addressed his grieving nation today in an emotional speech. ABC's chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel is in Belgrade tonight. Tonight, a nation united in grief after this 13-year-old boy killed nine people, including eight children, at his school in Serbia. At 8.40 this morning, authorities say the boy entered his school in the capital, Belgrade, first killing a security guard and shooting three children, reloading his weapon before going to his history class, shooting his teacher and opening fire on his fellow classmates. It was non-stop, this student says. Two minutes later, the boy left the school, calling the police on himself. A teacher and six other students wounded. Terrified parents racing to the school to find their children. Officials say the boy planned the attack for a month, making a list of students he wanted to murder and hand-drawn maps of the school. He was armed with two guns belonging to his father, and police say they also found four Molotov cocktails in his backpack. But under Serbian law, the child isn't criminally responsible because he's younger than 14. Instead, his parents have been detained. This isn't just a nation in mourning, it's a nation in shock. Serbia's never seen a school shooting ever before. And tonight, thousands and thousands of people in Belgrade have come out to show their respects. Some kids run. Georges is a 15-year-old student who was at the school. First, we thought it was firecrackers, but then we heard the... Um... My man shots and then we know it's a pistol. He, like so many here, in disbelief. We just don't do that. It doesn't happen here. It doesn't happen. Something they are not accustomed to there. Ian Panel joins us now. And Ian, you're hearing there may be new gun control measures already? Yeah, that's right, Lindsay. I think it's a mark of how much this has shaken the nation that just hours after this terrible shooting, Serbia's president goes live on air already proposing strict new gun control measures. Things like banning new licenses for two years and making it a crime to teach minors how to shoot. Now, not all of these things will necessarily go through, but some of them are highly likely to because there's a real sense here. It's 1.30 in the morning. People are gathered at Memorial behind me that things need to change and need to change quickly. Lindsay? Don't we know it here as well? Ian Panel, our thanks to you. The suspect in the killing of five neighbors in Cleveland, Texas, including a child, is now behind bars. Police say that he was found hiding in a closet under a pile of laundry about 11 miles away. Two other people were arrested for helping him, including his domestic partner. ABC's Matt Rivers has the details. After a nearly five day search, Francisco Oropesa in custody tonight. The man accused of killing five neighbors, shirtless and handcuffed, surrounded by police just moments after his capture. He will live out his life behind bars for killing those five. His partner, Divimara Nava, also charged, appearing in court today, accused of helping Oropesa stay on the run. Police say she was found in the same location as Oropesa, even planning a possible escape to his native Mexico. Authorities say a call to the FBI's tip line on Tuesday sent heavily armed officers racing to this house. They quickly go inside that house and they find Oropesa inside a closet hiding under a pile of clothes. Officials say the house where Oropesa was found belongs to a relative. It remains unclear if authorities searched that house prior to getting that tip. 
The home just 11 miles from where police say the suspect shot five people, including a mother and her nine-year-old son, in Cleveland, Texas, after they'd asked him to stop firing his own gun for fun. Matt Rivers joins us now from Texas. And Matt, we've heard that there's another arrest in connection to this case. Tell us about that. Yeah, that's right, Lindsay. One of uh, uh, Francisco Oropesa's friends, apparently, uh, is now also accused of helping him evade capture. That is a third-degree felony. And in speaking with authorities today, they say that as this investigation continues, they're continuing to look into who might have helped Oropesa eva evade capture, uh, which means more arrests could be coming down the pipeline. Lindsay. Matt Rivers for us. Thanks so much, Matt. Tonight, Tyree Nichols' family says that they have been told the official autopsy results of how their son died. Nichols' family says the DA's office called them this week and told them the autopsy report showed Nichols died of brain injuries from blunt force trauma. Nichols died in January after a traffic stop after he was repeatedly punched and kicked by Memphis police officers after a brief foot chase. While Nichols' mother has said that first responders told her that her son was drunk and high, the report shows that Tyree's blood alcohol level was 0.049. We turn now to the sexual assault and defamation trial brought by columnist E. Jean Carroll against former President Trump. His lawyers now say that they will not call any witnesses and make no defense. ABC senior national correspondent Eric Katursky has the latest from the courtroom. Donald Trump has refused to testify in his rape and defamation trial. So tonight, lawyers for E. Jean Carroll playing video of his deposition for the jury. In it, Trump claims he went to Bergdorf Goodman, where he allegedly raped Carroll, seldom if ever. Even though a witness has testified, he saw Trump shop there multiple times. Carroll's attorney asks Trump if he denied Carroll's rape claim by saying, she's not my type. Trump acknowledged he did. But in the same deposition, when Trump is shown this photo, he points to an image of Carroll from the late 1980s and says, that's Marla, mistaking his accuser for his ex-wife. Disparaging women's looks, Carol's attorneys say, is Trump's standard way of denying accusations of sexual assault. I came today to tell the truth. He said something similar about Natasha Stoinoff, a former reporter for People magazine, who testified today about her own alleged assault at Mar-a-Lago in 2005. He pushes me against the wall and he starts kissing me, Stoinoff told the jury. Trump says it never happened. Look at her. Look at her words. You tell me what you think. I don't think so. Stoinoff testified she first went public after hearing Trump's boast to access Hollywood's Billy Bush, a tape the jury watched today. You know, I'm automatically attracted to beautiful. I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet. You just kiss. I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Trump calls that locker room talk, but Carol's lawyers say it's further proof of a disturbing pattern of behavior. Trump is golfing in Ireland, where he said he had a long-standing commitment and told reporters, I hear we're doing very well in New York. Not testifying is a risk, but his attorneys may have been worried about an intense cross-examination. In fact, his attorney told the judge late today, Lindsay, the defense would call no witnesses at all. Lindsay? Very interesting development there, Aaron. Thank you. Now to the latest on Tucker Carlson's firing from Fox News. The New York Times has uncovered a text message Carlson sent the day after the January 6th attack. And what he wrote in that message may have played a role in the Fox board taking action to remove him from the network. Here's ABC senior national correspondent Terry Moran. For years, former Fox News star Tucker Carlson promoted racist views on his show, the highest rated program on Fox. Now the New York Times has obtained a text message from Carlson that shows he expressed similar views in private, too. In the text message to his producer sent the day after the January 6, 2021 attack on the Capitol, Carlson described a video he had recently seen showing a group of three Trump supporters attacking a person he called an Antifa kid. Jumping a guy like that is dishonorable, obviously. It's not how white men fight, Carlson wrote, admitting, suddenly I found myself rooting for the mob against the man, hoping they'd hit him harder, kill him. I really wanted them to hurt the kid. I could taste it. Carlson then added, an alarm went off. This isn't good for me. I'm becoming something that I don't want to be. That text was filed as part of Dominion's defamation lawsuit against Fox News, but never made part of the public record. Just before that lawsuit was settled on the eve of trial, the text was seen by members of the board of directors of Fox, according to the New York Times. Days later, Carlson was fired. For Fox executives, that text was apparently the final straw, but viewers had long heard Carlson give voice to a message of white supremacy, especially on the issue of immigration.
We have a moral obligation to admit the world's poor, they tell us, even if it makes our own country poorer and dirtier and more divided. We reached out to Tucker Carlson and to Fox News for comment, but neither has responded so far. Lindsay? Terry, thank you. Next, the Federal Reserve announced today that it was raising interest rates by a quarter of a percent, the Fed's 10th straight increase as Chairman Jerome Powell continues to fight persistent inflation. The rate increased to 5.25 percent. That's the highest rate in 16 years. Economic forecasters predict this will be the last rate hike for the foreseeable future. The Dow Jones was down 270 points today after the news. Still much more to get to here on Prime tonight. Coming up, a dangerously close call the warning police officers have for drivers after the release of this dramatic video. But next in our prime focus with rent rising across the country, more people are in need of affordable housing solutions, but some wait for more than a decade with no idea when they'll be approved. We look at what's causing the long waits and speak to families holding on to hope. Well, they didn't tell me anything. They just told me to fill out the application and just leave it and they gave me a receipt, so. And there's <laughs> nothing you can do from there. It's but nothing but wait. Wait, <laughs> wait it out. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back, everyone. As rent prices rise across the country, more people are struggling to make ends meet every month. When they turn to affordable housing, many are met with a new set of problems, wait lists that in some counties are nearly two decades long. It's forcing some families to take extraordinary measures to keep a roof over their heads, a goal that they can't always achieve as they struggle for years, not knowing if or when they'll ever get approval. ABC News has collaborated with our ABC-owned television stations for the past six months, investigating just how deep this affordable housing crisis goes. Our Stephanie Ramos has the story. I love everything about San Diego. The beaches are lovely. It's usually pretty sunny. You usually could wear flip-flops pretty much year-round. I ended up in San Diego. I was married. Um, my husband was stationed here. And um, I moved here from the Bay Area in, I think, 1996. And I stayed here after divorce because I loved it here. When I signed up for Section 8 and um, low-income housing, my kids were very small at that time. I did not feel that I would be on that list for 12 years. For Tanya Frazier, finding long-term housing within her budget has been an uphill battle. She's disabled, she's taken care of her three children, and has been waiting 12 years to be granted affordable housing by the San Diego Housing Commission. I'm just going to check myself on the waiting list and see where I am. Here we go. This is the waiting list portal, August 9th, 2011, at 5.19 p.m. Tanya says she's been checking on her status every month for the past decade, calling, waiting for a letter in the mail. Still, 
No one has been able to tell her where she is on that list or how long she'll have to keep waiting. Frustrated, sad, sometimes hopeless that I'm never going to come up on that list. The eighth biggest city in the U.S. San Diego's real estate business is bustling and growing. However, public housing complexes are not a common sight. ABC News, in collaboration with ABC-owned television stations, has spent the last six months investigating the public and affordable housing crisis affecting cities and towns across the country. We found that for housing vouchers, which are local subsidies helping renters find homes on the private market, the average wait in San Diego County is eight years. And for public housing, it has the longest wait time of any large metropolitan county in the entire U.S. In San Diego County, the wait list for public housing is over 18 years. We're just not building um, public housing like we used to. We're not providing enough housing vouchers for people to use on the private market. Today, what we're seeing is a housing crisis unlike one that we've seen since the mid-20th century. The average rent in San Diego County increased by about 54% between 2011 and 2021. I, I do have a roof over my head, but rent is expensive. It's 29.49 for this little house. With more than 90% of her income going to rent, Tanya has to share this house with her grown children and her friend Rosa. When I, I try to apply for low income, the waiting list is closed. And they tell me to keep calling, and I do, and I keep calling, but the waiting list is still closed. This hard reality has pushed people in San Diego to find desperate solutions. Some of them not finding a solution at all. We're seeing rates of homelessness steadily increase. We're seeing shelters filling up. We're seeing folks uh, struggling with massive amounts of debt as they try and pay their rent. We're seeing evictions rise. And stable housing is a solution to those problems. I have a bad habit. I love looking in people's windows because I just like to live, see how they live, you know, because I don't have that steady. It sucks seeing how many buildings that are brand new being built and me not being able to get not one. Brunel Whitfield has lived in San Diego her entire life. She joined the housing voucher waiting list right after having her first son. 12 years ago. It's like I feel like there's like somebody in there just, nope, Brunel Whitfield, we're not getting you nothing. Brunel says she has struggled every single day during these 12 years, taking care of her four children. I've done miracles to keep us off of the streets. I experienced homelessness a couple times, you know, um, unfortunately. I believe me and my kids' lives will be different if San Diego's wait list was like a couple months or a year, it would open doors where I would be able to put my daughter doing gym, my son doing, you know, soccer or something. I can't even, you know, do extra things for them like that. People lining up overnight to apply for affordable housing in New Jersey. By noon today, 1,500 applications were submitted. Housing officials are set to talk about the opening of the waitlist lottery for Section 8 housing vouchers. For the first time in more than a decade, the Philadelphia Housing Authority opened its housing choice voucher waiting list. But the website couldn't keep up with the demand. Christian Letta was here. The lack of public and affordable housing is a widespread issue. For instance, ABC's data analysis shows that public housing wait times exceed 17 years in Suffolk County, New York, nine years in Meeker County, Minnesota, and six years in Hines County, Mississippi. Right now in America, how big of an issue is public housing? We haven't built any large-scale public housing since uh, Richard Nixon put a moratorium on that construction in the 70s. But the demand for affordable housing has only increased um, uh, recently as you know, housing prices have increased and wages have stagnated. 
there isn't a state in the country where someone working at minimum wage with 40 hours a week can afford a typical you know, two-bedroom apartment. When you went to the Philadelphia Housing Authority, what did they tell you? Well, they didn't tell me anything. They just told me to fill out the application and just leave it, and they gave me a receipt, so. And there's nothing you can do from there, it's but, nothing but wait. Wait. <laughs> wait it out. Don Adams was raised in Philadelphia, eventually settling in Atlanta. Four years ago, her life was shattered when she lost her daughter to gun violence. She decided to return to a place that held her most precious memories. She's been waiting on the public housing list for four years, living with a friend and not making enough to afford a place of her own. It gets stressing, it gets depressing. Sometimes I I just be like, oh boy, well, should I just go back to Atlanta? <laughs> you know, sometimes I see days like that, but it's, it's, it's rough. Last year, Dawn was selected in a unique pilot program that provides monthly stipends to people from the bottom half of Philadelphia's housing wait lists. She's been saving those allowances so she can eventually use that money to rent a home. How does that make you feel to just, for, for a number of years now, to not really have a place to call home and be able to put your stuff and, and still waiting? That's frustrating sometimes, but I figure since I came this far and I made the, I got, <laughs> got picked from that, I, it's won't be, I figure it won't be long before I find somewhere to go. This pilot program will only last two and a half years. And during that time, Dawn is unlikely to reach the top of the housing wait list, according to estimates by the Philadelphia Housing Development Corporation. In the meantime, average rent prices in the area increased 9.5% between 2019 and 2021, according to the latest census data. But who is supposed to fix this? Is it each state, the counties, or the federal government? In the 1990s, Congress passed the Faircloth Amendment, which effectively froze the amount of public housing units that were in existence at that time and said, we're only gonna fund up to this many units nationwide. So that effectively banned the construction of any new public housing units, and that bill is still in effect. HUD is a bit between a rock and a hard place. They want to sustainably and affordably house residents across the country, but Congress simply isn't allocating enough money for them to do that. If we made it a priority, we would find the money for it. ABC News reached out to the Department of Housing and Urban Development several times, but the agency did not grant our request for an interview. In a statement, the agency said HUD recognizes that the country faces an affordable housing shortage and that in this year's budget proposal, the administration has requested additional resources to address this issue. I don't think we're doing enough, and I think that there is um, the will, but we need to find the way in order to build bipartisan support to get it done. It's important to understand that the housing market in this country has always been a public-private partnership. And the federal government and state and local governments um, need to do more to build that partnership so that this terrible shortage of housing can be fixed. There isn't one specific cause for this deeply complex issue. And advocates say there isn't one simple solution. But more federal funding, they say, could go a long way for millions of Americans still waiting for a place to live. 12 years, that's a long time to be on a list waiting for a Section 8. And sometimes I feel like giving up. But then I think, OK, well, I've been waiting for this long, so why not wait any longer? I feel as though it's going to happen. I mean, I'm not the one to give up, so I believe it's going to happen. I just got to be patient. Just be patient. I want security for my kids. That's all I want. I don't care what kind of place it is. I don't care if I have to start in a hut. I will start in a hut.
anything for the best of the children. Our thanks to Stephanie for that. Still much more to get to coming up. A historic approval for the FDA and for the treatment of respiratory viruses. The vaccine just cleared for older adults. Diversity has risen in front of the screen, but what about in other roles? Our Juju Chang takes a look at the power of AAPI representation behind the scenes in our culture conversations. But next, new research shows plunging test scores for students. We take a closer look at the decline by the numbers. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Brooke Shields, the most photographed woman in the world. A sexualized child model. Exploitation. What happened to her isn't really about her, it's just about women. I let myself be vulnerable, and this is the first time I've ever spoken about what happened. I thought my one no should have been enough, you know. When someone like Brooke Shields talks about it, it makes a difference. I'm amazed that I survived any of it. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. This is a case that has been confounding for decades. A clown pulls out a gun and fires at point blank range. Now, Friday night, the 2020 exclusive, The Son Who Witnessed It All. The last words I heard was, oh, how pretty, and bang. A shocking murder that took decades to unravel is now a mystery. Something breaks the case wide open. Finally solved. The stunning new 2020, Friday at 9, 8 central on ABC. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. New national test scores in history and civics show more concerning signs of learning loss likely made worse by the pandemic. Let's take a look by the numbers. About 40% of eighth graders scored below basic standards set on the National Assessment of Educational Progress History exam, as according to Education Department data released today. That's up from 34% testing below basic in 2019 and 29% back in 2014. And just 13% of eighth graders reached the proficiency 
standard in last year's history testing. Meanwhile, only 20% of eighth graders passed the national civics test in 2022. Taken from a national sample of about 8,000 eighth graders, the decline in scores in what's known as the nation's report card comes as some states are challenging or limiting instruction in history as polarized debates about race bleed into the classroom. The National Council for Social Studies recommends at least 45 minutes of daily instruction in the subject, according to the New York Times, but experts say there has been less emphasis on instruction in social studies in recent decades, and students are showing less knowledge of even the most basic history. The decline in history and civic scores follow recent declines in math and reading as well, with the average eighth grade math score down eight points compared to pre-pandemic levels. That shows what one education leader called the, quote, profound toll the pandemic took on learning, with low-performing students showing the biggest drops while high performers hold steady, only widening existing education gaps. And we still have much more ahead on Prime tonight. She may be the catalyst to reaching some of your fitness goals, but her journey hasn't been easy. Peloton's Emma Lovewell tells us how her new book is meant to inspire others to keep on pushing. And the inductees are in, the artists who will soon be part of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward, first choice. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. This is a case that has been confounding for decades. A clown pulls out a gun and fires at point blank range. Now, Friday night, the 2020 exclusive, The Son Who Witnessed It All. The last words I heard was, oh, how pretty, and bang. A shocking murder that took decades to unravel is now a mystery. Something breaks the case wide open. Finally solved. The stunning new 2020, Friday at 9, 8 central on ABC. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. 13 women opened their doors to the man who would end their lives. Truth and Lies, The Boston Strangler, the new true crime podcast series. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts and watch Boston Strangler starring Kira Knightley, streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. 
An FDA approval could be a major step in fighting the virus. Hard stopping video shows a dangerously close call for a police officer. And the latest Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees are announced. These stories and more in tonight's rundown. The FDA has approved the nation's first RSV vaccine, an historic moment after decades trying to come up with one. GSK created the vaccine for older adults, other companies developing similar vaccines as well as shots for young children. CDC expected to weigh in with specific recommendations in June. GSK's Dr. Phil Dormitzer told ABC News that the drug will make a huge difference. The fact that we now have a vaccine to prevent RSV disease in older adults is a game changer. Overdose deaths linked to fentanyl have skyrocketed 279% between 2016 and 2021, according to federal data. The National Center for Health Statistics National Vital Statistics System looked at death certificate records. There was an increase from 5.7 deaths per 100,000 people to 21.6 deaths per 100,000. Data also showed an increase in overdoses linked to other drugs, but nowhere near the levels of fentanyl. New York City police investigating how a woman fell from a Times Square hotel roof and died. They found the 20-year-old woman dead on the second story scaffolding at the Oyo Hotel. The woman was reportedly visiting New York City from Colorado with her boyfriend and their daughter. Police looking into claims the couple got into a violent brawl that spilled out of their room before the woman's death. Dramatic dash cam video shows the moment a Virginia patrol officer was nearly struck by an out-of-control vehicle. Police said the officer was conducting a traffic stop when a 17-year-old driver traveling at high speeds in the opposite direction lost control. The car spun around, crossed the median, and struck both vehicles on the side of the road. The officer and the driver in the traffic stop each had minor injuries, as did the 17-year-old driver and two other passengers. The 17-year-old was charged with reckless driving. NPR says Elon Musk is threatening to reassign that company's Twitter handle. NPR reporter Bobby Allen saying he received a series of emails from Twitter's CEO saying he would reassign the main at NPR handle to another organization or person. The threat tied to NPR's decision last month to no longer use Twitter after the company was labeled as state-affiliated media and government-funded media on that platform. NPR says that one of Musk's emails said that Twitter policy was to recycle handles that were definitively dormant and that the policy would apply to all accounts, including NPR. They've testified. testified. They've worked it. Let me work it. I put my thing down, flip it and reverse it. And they've always been on our minds. But you were always on my mind. Now, Rage Against the Machine, Missy Elliott, and Willie Nelson will be among 13 musical acts entering the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Others joining them, Sheryl Crow, George Michael, and Kate Bush. The latter enjoying a major resurgence after her song Running Up That Hill was featured in Stranger Things. The inductees will be honored at a ceremony and concert in November. It is Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, and tonight we're kicking off our series Culture Conversations with a look at the representation revolution happening in Hollywood. And it's not just happening on screen, it's also being powered by those behind the camera. So ABC's Juju Chang went behind the scenes with the director and writers of a film that could be this summer's breakout comedy. <laughs> It was a breakthrough night for Asian Americans in Hollywood. And the Oscar goes to everything, everywhere, everything, everywhere. Everything, everywhere. Asian Americans seem to be doing everything, everywhere in entertainment all at once. And much of this revolution on screen is being powered off screen by Asian American women. And this summer, fasten your seatbelts for Joyride. Directed by Adele Lim. I love a grand adventure. Joyride is hangover meets girls trip meets bridesmaids. My friends and I just wanted to tell a story about four thirsty, messy, ridiculous friends going out there and living their best lives. And everyone can see themselves in these women, which is hilarious. Everyone has that friend who's like, you know, seemingly doing well and trying too hard, but there's a super freak in there waiting to get out. Like, oh, you've met my friends. Oh, there you go. <laughs> 
yeah, this is an insane, fun comedy. And at its heart, it's just like, it's got, it's got this universal truth and a real lovely heart about belonging. And I think, you know, regardless of who you are, every one of us can relate to, you know, at some point in our lives, like not feeling like we belonged and not feeling like there was a place for us. And at the end of the day, finding our people is what tells us we belong. And that's really what our movie is about. You know who can bypass airport security? K-pop stars. In writing the movie, we weren't ever like, oh, we're gonna break stereotypes. We were just like, we're gonna write a movie that we think our friends would like to watch or that we would have liked to watch when we were growing up. So we weren't ever like, oh, we need to like make sure that people know that Asians are funny. We just wanted to be funny ourselves and make our friends laugh. And was the goal to push the envelope, be a little spicy? I think the goal was to entertain ourselves. Yeah. And because of who we are, it ended up being a little spicy. I am a good girl saving myself from marriage. Yeah, I do like that. What was it like watching their chemistry and watching them bring your characters to life? They, I think, were excited too. Like, we are leads in a movie. We have story arcs. Like, our characters develop over the course of a thing. Instead of being the sidekick. Instead of being the sidekick. And we all lived in the same building while we were filming. And were there noise complaints because people were having too much fun in each other's rooms? Absolutely. And that was also a joy to watch. Joyride is Lim's debut in the director's chair. There's been a lot of talk for years now about Asian American representation on screen. Mm. How important is it to be behind screen as well, sitting in that chair? It's everything. For the longest time, our stories were told by other people who didn't really understand our culture, did not walk in our shoes. And it is kind of gross to have the only depictions of yourselves be as someone else's sexual perverted fantasy or, you know, to be someone with an, you know, a dragon lady with an accent. And it becomes part of this cycle where the larger society, that's all they see of you and your culture. You've been quoted as saying that sometimes Asian stories were treated as the soy sauce on the entree and not really the entree. Yeah, that you're viewed as more of like an exotic seasoning than somebody or a character that people could view as the hero of the story. I think the landscape in Hollywood is so much more exciting right now because we're just open to all kinds of different stories and voices out there. Lim worked on hit TV shows for 17 years before her big film break, co-writing the game-changing blockbuster Crazy Rich Asians. Right, we've been dating for over a year now, and I think it's about time people met my beautiful girlfriend. But she made headlines, walking away from the highly anticipated sequel rather than be paid a fraction of what her white male co-writer was offered. What was your reaction once you discovered how severe the disparity was? Well, to be honest, I rage, really. And I felt like for me to accept something so much less than what I knew was my true value was somehow doing a disservice to everything this movie had achieved. We exist at the intersection of being female and a person of color in an industry that is very sort of white male dominated. Um, and there are systemic explanations for this. There have not been a lot of Asian female screenwriters um, who've been able to command that level, uh, um, you know, to be able to exist and operate at a certain level. Lim, who was born in Malaysia, moved on to co-write Disney's Raya and the Last Dragon. My name is Raya. Inspired by the cultures of Southeast Asia. And for you to be able to breathe life into that Disney princess, what does that feel like? I'm gonna cry. Uh, what, it, what it feels like is that it feels like you're seen. I'm a mother of a Southeast Asian girl and for her to be able to grow up seeing that there is a Disney princess that looks like her, that was, it was an unbelievable experience. Do you feel like Asian Americans and Asian American women specifically are having a moment in Hollywood? I think so. I mean, I don't never want to say it because then it feels real and then you never want to like think that, oh, we're just like a trend that like all of a sudden we're going to go away. Like we're like high-waisted jeans or something. It's like, no, we're here <laughs> to stay and we deserve our moment. If this moment, if we call it a moment, but we just want it to become the first in a series of an infinite number of moments. Does a raunchy comedy represent progress in Hollywood with four Asian American women centered at it? A thousand percent. <laughs> Absolutely. I want like an Asian Bob's Burgers, an Asian Family Guy. I want all of it for us.
Our thanks to Juju for that. Joyride will be released in theaters nationwide July 7th. And you can see more of our Culture Conversation series in the coming weeks and a full special airing May 24th. Live, learn, love well. If you have ever taken a class with our next guest, it's a sentiment that you likely know very well. Senior Peloton instructor Emma Lovewell is opening up about her journey to physical and mental wellness with sprinkles of her signature inspirational quotes, of course, along the way. In her new book, Live, Learn, Love Well, Lessons from a Life of Progress, Not Perfection. Emma Lovewell, kind enough to join us tonight. How are you? Thank you, I'm great, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm good, thanks for joining us. So let's start out with the beginning where you're talking about growing up in a small town with aspirations of becoming a dancer. What was it like reflecting on, on those times? Oh my gosh, I've come so far and I always encourage my riders and my Peloton classes to think about how far you've come because that's what it's all about. It's about the progress, it's not about the destination, but looking back and really appreciating where we come from and how far we've come. And is it true that your career basically started from a chance encounter in a $50 Craigslist post? <laughs> yes, yes, that's one of the many stories in the book, but I took a $50 Craigslist job that eventually ended up uh, where I'm at now at Peloton, but you'll have to read the book to yes. get all the juicy details. <laughs> and as you mentioned in the title, it's not about chasing perfection, but progress. How did you ultimately change your own mindset to then be able to pass that along to all of us? Yeah, I think I've gone through seasons of my life where I've been really focused on perfection and being perfect. And I had this realization that there's no such thing. There's no such thing as being perfect. That's just a word that exists that makes us feel bad because we're striving for something that we'll never actually get to. So I really like to focus on the progress instead, showing up for yourself every single day, doing what you can and knowing that that's enough. And that's where we reap the benefits. Of course, we're celebrating AAPI month. Yeah. And, and you talk about growing up of mixed race and not feeling like you were accepted in the white or Asian community. How did you finally come to that self-acceptance? I think I'm still on that journey, mm. honestly. I think it really started in college for me where I had to make new friends, introduce myself. You know, people are asking me, what are you? They were, you know, mm. confused what ethnicity I was. And I found myself really having to say, to look inside and, and figure out who I am, how I identify. And so that's been an ongoing journey, but I'm so proud of my heritage. I'm so proud of my relationship with my mom and how it's evolved. Again, if you read the book, you'll see that it was a little bit of a bumpy road, um, but it's, it is, I'm glad to be here, especially during this month. So one of our producers was taking your class over the weekend and wrote down this quote that you said, you can't hate yourself into change, you have to love yourself into greatness. Would you say that that's some advice that, that you actually followed yourself to get here? Oh, absolutely. That's one of my favorite quotes and I love saying that because I think uh, sometimes we are so hard on ourselves. We think we have to beat ourselves up. And I love saying, work out because you love your body, not because you hate it. This mm. is not punishment. We get to do this. We have this body, we have this life. Make the most of it and love yourself along the way. Otherwise, you know, why suffer? We should enjoy the process. You're right. It's all about the mindset. That, totally. that can make such a difference. All right. You, you are known, obviously, for many of your sayings, including that you can change the energy of the room that you walk into. Any others that you can kind of pass along for us today? Some, some advice, perhaps, that you've gotten that you'd like to share? I think um, get uncomfortable in order to get strong. I mm. think we think that we're striving for easy, we're striving for smooth sailing, and it's like the growth really happens in the discomfort, mm. in the hard challenges. So when you're climbing up that hill or you're in a season of discomfort, get through it and know that you're gonna be stronger on the other side. Emma, we thank you so much. I mean, I think half the people probably just follow your class so they can get the, the inspiration, right? Sure, it, it, yeah. I mean, and then the good, workout good music, comes along with good it. Good sweat, whatever the reason. <laughs> Emma, thank you so much. We want our viewers to know that her book is now available, Live, Learn, Love Well, wherever books are sold. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, a deadly mass shooting shuts down part of Atlanta for hours, what we know at this hour. And car thefts are spiking nationwide. The item one city is handing out to help people keep track of their cars.
This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Right now in America, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families front. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby! It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is a case that has been confounding for decades. A clown pulls out a gun and fires at point blank range. Now, Friday night, the 2020 exclusive, The Son Who Witnessed It All. The last words I heard was, oh, how pretty, and bang. A shocking murder that took decades to unravel is now a mystery. Something breaks the case wide open. Finally solved. The stunning new 2020, Friday at 9, 8 central on ABC. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We do have some breaking news to pass along. The manhunt for the suspect who opened fire inside an Atlanta doctor's office has come to an end. 24-year-old Dion Patterson has been apprehended after eluding authorities for hours. Patterson is accused of killing at least one person and injuring four others, all of them women, inside a doctor's office in the middle of Atlanta. The city of Atlanta is just the latest community to deal with a mass shooting in 2023. According to the Gun Violence Archive, there have been 100 90 so far this year. We're awaiting a press conference from the Atlanta Police Department. ABC News Live will bring you that live as it happens. Now to other developments here at ABC News at this hour. The suspect in the killing of five neighbors, including a nine-year-old little boy in Cleveland, Texas, is behind bars tonight. He was found hiding in a closet under a pile of laundry about 20 miles away at a relative's house. Two other people have been detained, including his domestic partner. Authorities say that as they closed in on him, schools were put on lockdown, but they lost his trail until getting a tip through the FBI tip line last night. The Federal Reserve announced today that it was raising interest rates by a quarter of a percent, the Fed's 10th straight increase as Chairman Jerome Powell continues to fight persistent inflation. The rate increased to 5.25 percent. That's the highest rate in 16 years. Economic forecasters predict that this will be the last rate hike for the, for the foreseeable future. The Dow Jones was down 270 points today after the news. And the Hollywood writer's strike begins its second day with no no signs of movement from either side. Writers were back on the picket lines today demanding a new three-year contract, which includes pay increases linked to streaming services. Most film and TV productions are now on pause. Late-night late TV shows have already been forced into airing reruns. 
And we move overseas now to a shocking explosion over the Kremlin. This video shows what appears to be a drone flying toward the dome of the building and exploding over the Russian Senate building. Video circulating online appears to show the dome on fire. Tonight, Ukraine is strongly denying claims from Russia that they are responsible. So who launched the attack and why? Marcus Moore reports in tonight from Ukraine. Tonight, those stunning images showing apparent drones exploding over the Kremlin. Video posted by state media of the moment the first drone smashed into the Senate Palace Dome around 2.27 in the morning. 16 minutes later, a second drone exploding as it approached the Russian flag. Smoke billowing from the scene. Russia tonight accusing Ukraine of an assassination attempt on Vladimir Putin, who was not there, calling it, quote, a planned terrorist attack and saying it intercepted both drones using radar warfare systems, the Kremlin providing no evidence to back up its claims, but also issuing an ominous warning, saying Russia has the right to retaliate where and when it sees fit. President Zelensky today in Finland fiercely denying Ukraine's involvement. We don't attack Putin or Moscow. Uh, we fight on, on our territory. We are defending our villages and cities. We don't have, you know, enough weapon for this. Secretary Blinken today questioning Russia's claims. I would take anything coming out of the Kremlin with a very large shaker of salt. Among the possible scenarios, did Ukraine order the attack? Was it conducted by a pro-Ukrainian group inside Russia? Or was it the Russians who put the drones up themselves to make it look like Ukraine attacked them? Ukraine had the motive and the means to conduct this attack. It could be a false flag, but it would end up hurting Putin and his reputation more than it would help him. This coming after multiple attacks inside Russia, including drone strikes on oil depots and two train derailments on back-to-back -back days. Our thanks to Marcus. Next to a school shooting in Serbia where a 13-year-old student opened fire with his father's pistol, killing eight classmates and a security guard, injuring seven others. He then called police and surrendered without incident. Police say he carefully planned the attack and had a list of children that he planned to kill. Serbia's president addressed his grieving nation tonight in an emotional speech. ABC's chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel is in Belgrade for us tonight. Tonight, a nation united in grief after this 13-year-old boy killed nine people, including eight children, at his school in Serbia. At 8.40 this morning, authorities say the boy entered his school in the capital, Belgrade, first killing a security guard and shooting three children, reloading his weapon before going to his history class, shooting his teacher and opening fire on his fellow classmates. It was non-stop, this student says. Two minutes later, the boy left the school, calling the police on himself. A teacher and six other students wounded. Terrified parents racing to the school to find their children. Officials say the boy planned the attack for a month, making a list of students he wanted to murder and hand-drawn maps of the school. He was armed with two guns belonging to his father, and police say they also found four Molotov cocktails in his backpack. But under Serbian law, the child isn't criminally responsible because he's younger than 14. Instead, his parents have been detained. This isn't just a nation in mourning, it's a nation in shock. Serbia's never seen a school shooting ever before. And tonight, thousands and thousands of people in Belgrade have come out to show their respects. Some kids run. Georges is a 15-year-old student who was at the school. First, we thought it was firecrackers, but then we heard the... Um... My man is shot and then we know it's a pistol. He, like so many here, in disbelief. We just don't do that. It doesn't happen here. It doesn't happen. So unusual for them there. Our thanks to Ian for that. Turning now to Colorado, where a man was shot and killed at a Tesla charging station. The incident occurred this morning in the area of Edgewater, not far from Denver. Jefferson County Sheriff's Office says that two men were involved in an altercation when one of them opened fire. The victim was transported to a hospital in serious condition where he later died. The alleged gunman fled the scene but ended up calling 911 to report his involvement in a shooting. He has now been detained and interviewed by police. Authorities are still investigating just what led up to that shooting. And we turn now to the sexual assault and defamation trial brought by columnist E. Jean Carroll against former President Trump. His lawyers now say that they will not call any witnesses and make no defense. ABC senior national correspondent Aaron Katursky has the latest from the courtroom. Donald Trump has refused to testify in his rape and defamation trial. So tonight, lawyers for E. Jean Carroll playing video of his deposition for the jury. In it, Trump claims he went to Bergdorf Goodman, where he allegedly raped Carroll, seldom if ever. 
Even though a witness has testified he saw Trump shop there multiple times. Carol's attorney asks Trump if he denied Carol's rape claim by saying, she's not my type. Trump acknowledged he did. But in the same deposition, when Trump is shown this photo, he points to an image of Carol from the late 1980s and says, that's Marla, mistaking his accuser for his ex-wife. Disparaging women's looks, Carol's attorneys say, is Trump's standard way of denying accusations of sexual assault. I came today to tell the truth. He said something similar about Natasha Stoinoff, a former reporter for People magazine, who testified today about her own alleged assault at Mar-a-Lago in 2005. He pushes me against the wall and he starts kissing me, Stoinoff told the jury. Trump says it never happened. Look at her, look at her words. You tell me what you think. I don't think so. Stoinoff testified she first went public after hearing Trump's boast to access Hollywood's Billy Bush, a tape the jury watched today. You know, I'm automatically attracted to beautiful. I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet. You just kiss. I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Trump calls that locker room talk, but Carol's lawyers say it's further proof of a disturbing pattern of behavior. Our thanks to Aaron Katursky. Now to the latest on Tucker Carlson's firing from Fox News. The New York Times has uncovered a text message Carlson sent the day after the January 6th attack. And what he wrote in that message may have played a role in the Fox board taking action to remove him from the network. Here's ABC's senior national correspondent, Terry Moran. For years, former Fox News star Tucker Carlson promoted racist views on his show, the highest rated program on Fox. Now the New York Times has obtained a text message from Carlson that shows he expressed similar views in private, too. In the text message to his producer sent the day after the January 6, 2021 attack on the Capitol, Carlson described a video he had recently seen showing a group of three Trump supporters attacking a person he called an Antifa kid. Jumping a guy like that is dishonorable, obviously. It's not how white men fight, Carlson wrote, admitting, suddenly I found myself rooting for the mob against the man, hoping they'd hit him harder, kill him. I really wanted them to hurt the kid. I could taste it. Carlson then added, an alarm went off. This isn't good for me. I'm becoming something that I don't want to be. That text was filed as part of Dominion's defamation lawsuit against Fox News, but never made part of the public record. Just before that lawsuit was settled on the eve of trial, the text was seen by members of the board of directors of Fox, according to the New York Times. Days later, Carlson was fired. For Fox executives, that text was apparently the final straw, but viewers had long heard Carlson give voice to a message of white supremacy, especially on the issue of immigration. We have a moral obligation to admit the world's poor, they tell us, even if it makes our own country poorer and dirtier and more divided. Our thanks to Terry for that. A curious moment played out on the Senate floor this afternoon. Republican Senator Tom Tillis of North Carolina was reading a letter written by Martin Luther King Jr. from the Birmingham jail. While reading directly from the letter, Senator Tillis read the N-word out loud. Reading the letter is an annual tradition, but we checked and in recent years, most lawmakers have not read the term. Instead, skipped over it, replaced it with the word expletive or racial slur. Senator Tillis is not the first person to use it, though. Senator Lisa Murkowski said the word during the 2021 reading. Now to the crackdown on car theft. With a nationwide spike here in New York City, hundreds of free Apple AirTags are being given out to car owners to prevent such thefts. ABC News' transportation correspondent Gio Benitez has the details. As car thefts nationwide spike, the NYPD fighting back with a tiny piece of technology. It's without a doubt a game changer. A game changer. New York City handing out 500 free Apple AirTags to help drivers and law enforcement track stolen cars. So how are you going to distribute all of these AirTags? People in the community can call their local crime prevention officers and then we'll arrange to get the AirTag to them. Here's how the tracker works. Put the AirTag or a similar device into a hidden spot in your car. If a thief takes your car, the signal will be captured by other iPhones nearby, helping you and police find them quickly. We have seen other crimes that were committed with stolen vehicles. So this is why it's very important. We have this technology to help us assist. The NYPD says there have been nearly 4,500 car thefts so far this year, up almost 14 percent since 2022. Specifically, certain Kia and Hyundai models targeted in a TikTok challenge. Ain't that crazy, huh? Police say some of those cars lack anti-theft controls. Stefan Mantic's Kia was stolen in Michigan. We were leaving the theater and I saw my car pull off right in its spot, just pull out in front of me. 
and drive away. 22 states and D.C. are calling on automakers to take action to help curb the rise in thefts. This morning, both Kia and Hyundai telling ABC News they have taken action to keep customers safe, offering software upgrades and steering wheel locks. We're talking about all cars could benefit from something like this, in your view. Right now, for us, in fighting crime, we're asking people to go out, and it's not, very, it's not expensive at all, to go out and put one of these in your car as an extra measure of protection. Could certainly help. Our thanks to Geo for that. Turning now to Jenny Craig, where the company will be shutting down most of its operations as early as Friday. The weight loss giant may shutter its corporate offices this week as part of the likely transition to e-commerce. The company notified its employees that it will end the bulk of operations this summer, but wrote that if they cannot secure financing soon, they will close as early as May 5th. The company anticipates mass layoffs. A spokesperson for Jenny Craig did not immediately respond to ABC's request for comment. Still much more to get to tonight coming up. Some of the people who have shaped our lives the most have been teachers. ABC's Deborah Roberts tells us how her new book is shining a light on educators who've helped mold some of the most notable people in the world. But next, heavy rain triggers deadly flooding and landslides. The rising death toll as rescuers embark on the desperate hunt for survivors. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's Bring how you start your, your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Traveling with the president in Dublin, Ireland, I'm Mary Bruce. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. We're tracking several headlines around the world. More than 130 people have died after intense rain caused major flooding and landslides in northern Rwanda today. Officials say the rains came down at night while people were sleeping. Government officials are frantically searching house by house by to search for those who may be trapped. The rescue effort has been hampered by heavy rains and persistent flooding. This is the worst flooding disaster in Rwanda since 2020 when 80 people died. Earlier today, police in Brazil raided the home of former president in Bolsonaro. They reportedly seized his cell phone as part of an investigation into the falsification of his COVID-19 vaccination records, which claimed that he had been vaccinated in order to gain entry into the United States during the height of the pandemic. Bolsonaro has spoken publicly about his resistance to taking the vaccine and said earlier today that he has never been vaccinated for COVID-19. Bolsonaro claims that he was never asked for vaccination records before entering the U.S. A top
top aide and two security guards for Bolsonaro have been arrested in connection with the case. And for the second week in a row, Iguan has seized an oil tanker, this time in the Strait of Hormuz. The oil tanker departed Dubai and was heading to the United Arab Emirates when a dozen Iranian vessels surrounded the tanker. Officials from the U.S. Navy said today was the seizures, quote, was unwarranted, irresponsible, and presented a threat to maritime security and the global economy. We all have teachers who help shape our future selves. And in her new book, Lessons Learned and Cherished, The Teacher Who Changed My Life, ABC's Deborah Roberts brings together an inspiring collection of essays from celebrity contributors celebrating the teachers who molded them. And I'm so pleased to welcome my friend, hey. Deborah Roberts. Hey. How are you? I'm good. We've and not just celebrity about. contributors either, because there's some re regular folks in there, too. Mm -hmm. um, a good friend of mine who is the CEO of the Girl Scouts in East mm -hmm. in Middle Tennessee told me her story. So a lot of different stories from all walks of life. We've been talking about this for, for quite some time now, but what inspired you to do it? It seems like teachers just don't get their proper due. It's yeah. often like a thankless yeah. job, oh, and, yeah. and they're really not celebrating. Yeah, and you know what, Lindsay? I would like to say that it was probably organic. It wasn't. I didn't set out necessarily to, to pen a love letter to teachers, but I was thinking about writing a book, and I was sort of thinking about my own journey, and I started thinking about Mrs. Dorothy Hardy, my oh, sixth grade oh. English teacher, and I remembered how much it resonated anytime I talked about her in a speech or just sort of mentioned her, and then how other people people would share stories about their teachers. And then as a journalist, I started thinking about the headlines, that teachers are feeling disrespected and disregarded and, and all of that. And I thought, you know, this is a time to really think about this. When I hear all these beautiful stories about what teachers did for people, maybe they need to hear these stories right at this moment. So that was it. And, and when you talk about teachers being in crisis, you were saying a number, I think it was like in 50 years? Teachers are, are, are least satisfied with their jobs right now is like a 50-year low. Mm -hmm. And then people going into the profession, high school seniors and then a, a, a college freshmen, 50 years, they've never been that disinterested. So it's a crisis point right now. And I think that we've, we've been there before. Mm -hmm. We've seen this in the 70s where teachers were really, really having a hard time. And governments jumped in, started paying teachers a little better, paying attention to their needs, and we turned it around. And I think we can turn this around again. I immediately started thinking about Barbara Mail and my first grade teacher. Uh, but you know what? It wasn't any, a lesson that yeah. she taught. It yeah. was what she put into me as far as confidence. She somehow cast me as the weather girl, as the lead in our play in, <laughs> in, in first grade. But it meant so much. Right. And, and I'm curious about Mrs. Hardy and, and what it is that she gave you that you still talk about. Mrs. Her. Hardy said to me she was a very, very tough taskmaster, an English teacher who demanded proper grammar and poetry, and she was no nonsense sense didn't really crack many smiles but one day she said to me in that southern accent you know you're a very smart girl Deborah mm -hmm. you're gonna go far in life mm -hmm. and I just remember just feeling like puffed up mm. that Mrs. Hardy thinks I've got something and I set out to sort of prove her right and I I, I flourished you did. I flourished <laughs> and then went on from there so sometimes it just takes a teacher saying you're smart I see you, yeah. you're valued, you need something that I can see that you need that may have nothing to do with academics, but has everything to do with filling you up and filling your soul a little bit. And, and you just reminded me of a quote that I read in your book, when excellence is the expectations, kids rise to the challenge. And I'm wondering if there is a common thread, because when you talk about lessons learned, mm -hmm. when you talk to all these different people from different walks of life, as far as what they got, what was instilled in them by that teacher? Do you Very have a takeaway? Yeah, very few of them will talk about uh, that that um, uh, lesson that they, you know, they got an A on or that that report that they were able to ace or that, you know, any other project that they did. They always talk about a lesson. Melody Hobson, the investment titan, mm -hmm. talked about a teacher who was very hard on her. Mm -hmm. And Melody said, lest you think that this is abusive, and it wasn't, but I learned grit from that teacher. Mm -hmm. So she had a tough experience that taught her not to miss those spelling words again and how to go on and be stronger. Most people talked about an incident that, or not just an incident, just sort of, uh, just a feeling that a teacher gave them that actually propelled them onto something else. It wasn't always about academics. It was rarely about academics. It was about kindness. It was about believing in them, um, giving them something. As, as Oprah said, somebody saw her. They saw her intelligence. Mm. They didn't think she was just smart, but that she was intelligent. Mm. And that went a long way to making her feel like she was special. Uh, you know, often we reserve 
the appreciation for like Teacher Appreciation Day. And so this is really a nice celebratory uh, for, for all teachers out there who are in many cases just taken for granted. And as you've discussed, you know, the, the difficult hardships right now. One other quote that I saw in there that kind of sums it up, there is nothing more selfless generous and kind than offering oneself in the service of educating others. And I think mm. that, what a salute that you have here, yeah. Deb. I just, I'm so proud of it, and I hope teachers take it and feel that this is a love letter to yes. them. Overdue. A love letter. Deborah Roberts, thank you. I'm so glad we were able oh, to have you in studio. I'm so happy to be here, and thanks, and I hope you enjoy the book, and buy another one for somebody else. We sure will. <laughs> Lessons Learned and Cherished, The Teacher Who Changed My Life is available now wherever books are sold. And still to come, encouraging kids to dream of a brighter future. The colleges and universities helping to show students just how many options they have. This is a case that has been confounding for decades. A clown pulls out a gun and fires at point blank range. Now, Friday night, the 2020 exclusive, The Son Who Witnessed It All. The last words I heard was, oh, how pretty, and bang. A shocking murder that took decades to unravel is now a mystery. Something breaks the case wide open. Finally solved. The stunning new 2020, Friday at 9, 8 central on ABC. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Right now in America, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Finally tonight, connecting children with a brighter future. Chicago Public Schools are helping students tour historically black colleges and universities to get exposure to their options. Reporter Kate Kogirin from our partner station ABC7 in Chicago has this story in our local lowdown. Dozens of Chicago Public Schools students boarded a bus today. This trip is, is one of those trips. Bound for countless possibilities. It changes the trajectory for a lifetime. Latrell Cowley is a senior at Wendell Phillips Academy High School. He said before he joined the Chicago mentorship program, Becoming a Man, he lived a different life. At first, I wasn't going on no trips with no one. I was just going class, going class. Now Cowley and about 70 other CPS students are on the road with people they've just met to spend their spring break touring Southern colleges. And I get to go to places I've never been. Including six historically black colleges and universities, some universities that Cowley has already applied to. I get to like visit colleges that I always dreamed of going to. For Cowley and others, this collegiate tour is a journey of a lifetime. A lot of them only know their black. A lot of them have not been downtown before, let alone out of the state, going to multiple states. The BAM mentorship program has organized this annual road trip since 2015. This is the first time the tour is back since the COVID-19 pandemic. And I am so excited because they literally get to see other parts of this world that they never probably would have saw if it wasn't for this program. While traveling has been an exciting part of joining the program, for 14-year-old Matthew Lewis, he says without BAM... I wouldn't talk to a lot of people that I talk to now. I wouldn't, I wouldn't talk at all. So this helped me talk to more people. The program and this trip valued more for the meaning to those part of it. It inspires from the youngest to the oldest. I can get out of my comfort zone. I can do, I can do whatever I want without no one judging who I am or not. It is fun to me. Changing their trajectory. Our thanks to Kate for bringing us that. And that's our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com.